Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. I am your host, Adam Portress, and I'm joined today by Sweet Shawnsy from the internet. Thanks, Punk Portress. And of course, Bruce Leslie. I'm a prickly pear, but you guys can call me Hoot Nanny. <laughs> Why would we call each other these things? Uh, you can only find out by being a supporter over at patreon.com slash HMP. Spilling the beans all over the place. Sorry, we'll clean those up later. Uh, but before we get to that, though, I do want to say, speaking of Patreon, we do have a brand new member to the Patreon team coming in at the $5 a month, Joe B. Joe B., thank you uh, for being amongst the most beautiful people in the world, the people that support this show over at patreon.com slash HMP. There you get the pre-show, post-show, and of course, the Dinger Zone, where we talk all about childhood nicknames, trips, and all kinds of really stupid stuff that uh, you can only find there. Just It's embarrassing. Just go listen to it. It's, uh, it's a fun time. But let's give Joe his uh, nickname here. Bruce, you've, uh, you've, headed to, you've headed it to the lab for this one. What have you cooked up for us this week? Well, Joe B's in luck because I was recently driving through Southern Ohio and just out of nowhere, for some reason, I got the idea that a great nickname would be Cincinnati Slingshot. So with Sean's approval, maybe we can give Joe B the nickname Cincinnati Slingshot. Let's go to the committee. Oh, we're all thumbs up over here, boys. So Joe B from this point, Bruce, Uh, you give the, give the announcement. Do you remember how to do it? Sean's been doing uh, it. Don't Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh uh, by the internet's powers invested in in the great sweet Shanzi, by proxy, I proclaim you Cincinnati Slingshot. Cincinnati Lawless Slingshot. Lawless and beautiful. Thank you. Oh, absolutely awesome. So if you'd like to be like the good old Cincinnati Slingshot, get yourself an HMP nickname and all the good things that go along with it, head on over to patreon.com slash HMP today and uh, join the family. We'd really appreciate that, and we really appreciate all of you. Uh, This week, we're going to be talking about Polar. It is a movie that is on Netflix right now. Let's go ahead and take a listen to the trailer. I like it here. It makes me peaceful. Me too. You're not from around here, are you? No, I'm retired. What was your job? I was in the funeral business. Huh. As you know, we manage the investments of our employees. If a former agent dies after retirement, their $8 million goes back to the company. This is a bad idea. Bang. Where the hell is he? Somebody set me up over here. You better pray you have nothing to do with it. Think of a monster, you tried to kill the black guys and kidnap his cute little neighbor. We should pay him so we don't have to look over our shoulder for the rest of our lives. You'll need all of it. Try not to be scared. You make mistakes when you're afraid. Thought you stopped smoking. Figured it wouldn't kill me. That was the trailer for Polar. Our uh, it's almost kind of a new release. It's from 2019. It's on Netflix right now. Uh, but before we get into the full details of this, let's do this. It's time for Bruce's comic book connection. Bruce, if this thing didn't tell me that it was a comic book related thing, I wouldn't know. Please enlighten us. Well, Polar is based on what was initially a web comic. And though this probably isn't the first webcomic adaptation we've ever covered, it feels like it's the first in a good while. 
And the comic is by writer and artist Victor Santos. And something sort of special about the original incarnation of the comic was that it was largely silent, meaning the pictures told the story without dialogue bubbles or boxes. Also, I think the original stories were done with only black, white, and orange used for colors. And that makes it feel a little like the Sin City story, The Yellow Bastard, in a way. Uh, but the comics were collected and eventually published by Dark Horse Comics, who did add speech bubbles to give the stories a more traditional feel and try to reach the widest market possible, because that's the kind of thing that uh, publishers need to do. Uh, but the Polar comic is actually a follow-up to an original graphic novel that Santos did that was called The Black Kaiser, with, of course, The Black Kaiser being the main character. But Polar's the story about how that retired hitman was forced out of retirement. And the story's been described as bleak. It features a femme fatale character with a large amount of gore, and it's set in an icy landscape. And Victor Santos stated that his Black Kaiser character was actually inspired by Jim Steranko's S.H.I.E.L.D. comics. And uh, that becomes kind of obvious, I think, when you see the eye patch go on there. And <laughs> Santos has also described the creation of this story as mixing classic Marvel books, the Bourne movies, and manga action. He didn't find a publisher that was interested in his sequel to Black Kaiser originally, so that's when he decided the web was the way to go. And he felt like the format allowed him to follow readers' responses for each update and to correct mistakes more rapidly. And he also stated that he loved the widescreen layout that was possible on web pages. Uh, as a personal project, Polar allowed Santos to develop storytelling experiments without lim limitations. And Santos decided to use a minimal style for the webcomic, uh, particularly the limited colors, uh, so that each page wouldn't take more than a few hours to complete. He uh, also described Polar as a tribute to artists like the aforementioned Jim Steranko, as well as Jose Antonio Munoz, Alberto Breccia, Alex Toth, and Frank Miller. And as for the lack of dialogue, he's also been reported that he kind of decided to exclude it because he speaks Spanish and he didn't really want to uh, waste time translating from Spanish to English for the webcomic. But if you're in for a different taste of Santos art, you can absolutely get that because he took over the art duties, uh, starting with volume two of the Mice Templar, which is kind of like the Knights Templar, uh, but with mice. Oh, really? <laughs> and the way things are going, it's probably only a matter of time until Netflix produces that. And of course, I'll be watching. Well, Netflix uh, does pump a lot of money to a lot of things. Let's find out if this one is worth its while. Here's the IMDb plot line. IMDb always 100% correct in everything they say and or do. A retiring, a retiring assassin suddenly finds himself on the receiving end of a hit contracted by none other than his, old his own employer seeking to cash in on the pensions of aging employees. This is starring Mads Mikkelsen, Vanessa Hudgens, Catherine Winwick, Faye Wren, and more. Directed by Jonas Ackerlund. And uh, he, the only thing that people may recognize that he's done, uh, he did like tons and tons of music videos, but he did Lords of Chaos, which I didn't see, but I heard a lot of people uh, enjoyed quite a bit who are into that kind of scene. Uh, and, and he's Scandinavian like Mickelson, right? I believe so. Yeah, I thought I saw that he was Swedish, but I could have gotten that wrong. Uh, Denmark, Danish. Danish. Okay, that was close. close enough. You're in. You're in the vicinity. You throw a rock, you'll hit one of these. Uh, one of these folks for sure. Uh, I had zero idea about what this uh, movie was ahead of time. Bruce last week said, "Hey, this is a comic book thing." We're like, "Okay, it's on Netflix. It's easily available." All I knew was the name was Polar. Mads Mikkelsen was in it, and he was wearing an eye patch, looking like Metal Gear Solid. And before you Metal Ge Gear Solid people start emailing me, I'm, it's it's Big Boss or whatever. Just shut up. I you know what I'm talking about. But that's all I knew going into this. And, uh, man, I wish I would have known more. <laughs> oh, really? Really? Okay, so let's, let's start here. Bruce, what did, what did you think of Polar? Well, first off, last week when I recommended it, I just didn't want anything at all like The Saint. And this is definitely not like The Saint. Um, stuff happens here. Okay. And I think that what a lot of people have uh, have said about it, you know, after I watched it, I kind of read some commentary out there and they agreed with what my uh, moments when I was watching this. I thought, you know, this has a little bit of a 
of a John Wick feel to it with the guy kind of coming out of retirement and having to kill everybody. And then I also thought, you know, it's also got a little bit of Leon the professional with that whole relationship that we'll find out near the end with the twist that's revealed with uh, uh, the young girl that he spares when he assassinates her family. And, you know, I was glad that a lot of other people had seen that same kind of similarity there. And, you know, I'm not saying that this is anything great, but it's I, it absolutely didn't feel like a waste of time watching it. I, I was way more into the first hour of this than I was into the first hour of The Saint. And now we go to Sweet Shonzi. What, what early thoughts on Polar? Let's get him out of the way. Well, this is the second time I've seen this movie. Cause oh, I really? Saw, uh, yeah, I saw it, um, I think, when it first came out to Netflix last year. Mm-hmm. Um, this movie is the best way I can describe it is if you are a 14 year old boy, this is the greatest movie that has ever been made. That's, that was precisely my thought. If you're between like 12 and 14, 16 years old, you are going to love this movie. The, I think that's a good one. I wouldn't disagree with that. And, and you know, it's not, it's not a bad movie. It's not a great movie. It, it's it's a movie you know sometimes I, I i i can't speak for for our our female listeners but as a nerdy boy i can tell you that sometimes on a saturday afternoon all i want to see is a 14 year old boy movie and this is the thing this is this is that 14 year old boy movie that like oh hey like i i had known nothing about this movie it looks like it could be terrible or it could be great. Let's check it out. And so I checked it out. The first time I checked it out, I was like, this movie is better than it has any right to be. However, on second viewing, I can tell you that having Mads Mikkelsen in your, in your movie, um, you immediately heighten everything around it Mm -hmm. because he is a very, very good actor. And, so when Johnny Knoxville shows up and he's a terrible actor or, you know, uh, what I can only assume is a, uh, a very drunk Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like that, on, that floored me. I don't think that's acting. I think he's actually drunk in that. And in no that makeup scene. or anything. They just let him on because it was like, oh, my goodness. So sad. We, you know, they probably were high fiving each other that he agreed to do it. Yeah. But I mean, you know, he is barely in this movie, even when he's in this movie. <clears throat> but you don't need any of that because Mads Mikkelsen is so good. Um, I don't I, I, I don't know how to think about the rest of the movie. Like, I think that uh, it's fun. Like they have a lot of fun bits to it. But when. On second viewing, it's not something where you're like, at least me, it's not something where when I watch it, I go, yeah, yeah, I was right the first time. It's more like, oh, this doesn't hold up as well. Yeah, uh, this movie felt a lot to me like it was about, let's say, 15 years too late. (laughs) Uh, I. I feel like this movie is, and how this movie is made is almost practically out of vogue now, uh, because there's there's very much a um, the feeling from the the crash guys and all that, because uh, this this feels or, or crank rather, excuse me, crank, uh, the crank films, Neville Dean and Taylor. I was it, just wondering where you're going with crash crank. <laughs> Sorry, but the crank movies, it feels like that, but like the crank movies are almost like cranked so to 11 that like it the the joke kind of comes back in on itself in a weird way uh with this basically the crank movies are are better than crash please continue yes (laughs) far far better uh but with this it felt like they were trying to do that neville dean and taylor thing plus add like your leon elements there's like it lit an old boy element in a weird way uh it's just it is it's 2 hours long. It is it's f- frankly it's boring to me. I was like there's a couple of great moments in this movie and we'll talk about those. Uh but overall, I found it just droll and boring and slow. Uh 
it's it's almost like there's really two different movies here. There's Mad Mads Mickelson's movie over here, and then there's the Henchman movie over here, and they almost sort of meet for like half a second. But I think you could take all of the villain stuff, which I think is the garbage stuff in this movie, take all of that out, reshoot all of that, and give us something that's worth a crap because all of that is just it seems so late '90s, early 2000s villainy kind of over the topness and with the uh the one guy who was in doctor who he sucks uh i'm you know but oh just bad uh also 15 years too late 15 years is almost enough time that you can start going back around to something too though maybe but like i i those movies while they made enough money they never really got to that you know crazy popular level where everybody was kind of trying to do that i guess so when- when you say you were bored, were you more bored than the Saint? Uh, the, yeah, because the Saint was like the Saint was stupid, but like at least, and I'll I'll grant you, there are some better action scenes in here. There are a couple. The hallway fight, more or less, we'll call it, is is fantastic. There's a couple, you know, a bit of gunplay, but I'll be honest, like a lot of this movie kind of felt like just skeevy and gross to me to be honest i really i gotta say there is something about this movie where when you're watching the mads mickelson character just be a sad old man walking around the remote small town there is something really great about that part of the movie i could watch that movie all day long (laughs) but when it comes to the -the over-the-top stuff the 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 not even one dimensional characters of the henchman and uh, the fat guy from uh, Little Britain and you know like th- that part of the movie that holds no sway for me the second time I watch it but the first time I watched it it was interesting because at least you're like, for me anyway I was like oh wow didn't didn't see him doing that didn't see that coming that sort of thing you know. Well, I've only seen it once, so I can't comment on rewatching. But I'm just really surprised, Adam, to hear you call it boring because uh, uh, I, even when it was slow, I wasn't bored. Like the the levels of boredom I experienced in the Saint that that's why I held this movie to an incredibly low bar, and uh, uh, like the, it surpassed that incredibly low bar that was set the week before by the Saint. But in my head, I kind of thought like a little test to tell if you should be watching a movie or not. It's like it, when I was watching The Saint, I actually thought, you know, this movie is so bad that I actually would find it more interesting if it had Andy Dick and uh, Polly Shore in it. Because then, even though it's still going to be a horrible movie, then I'm going to be a little curious. But this movie this week would have definitely not held my interest as much with those two. So that's a real low bar. If they make the movie better, I shouldn't be watching it. If they make it worse, I'll keep watching. And I guess that's part of my, like, you know, just gripe is that, like, when watching this, it did just feel very derivative of things that I'd seen, you know, time and time and time again. It doesn't really give us a whole lot of new stuff to kind of chew on here. If you really kind of break all the basic elements of this story down, it's fairly cliche. Yeah, but uh, sure, of course it's cliche. It's for 14-year-old boys. But when it comes to the smaller stuff, like him being clever... Um, there's a lot of great like tough guy lines in this movie. That part's cool. I, I, you know, it's once you know the movie you're going to see, at least for me, when it comes to something like this, I at least want to see them be good at the thing that they're making. And that's to me what this movie is, is that they, they know what this is. The, the people who made this movie know what this movie is. And so they do a good job of making a dumb movie. And, and it, is a, it is a good, dumb movie. Plus, like, they introduce what's supposed to be the cute little puppy dog sidekick, and they make the good decision of getting rid of that quick. Yeah. Uh, I'm well, just... that's, it, that's it. Hold on. Hold on. Let's stop for a second, because Bruce thought he was going to get away with it. But we're paying attention, Bruce. We yeah. know. <laughs> We know you you don't like dogs. We get it. Uh, so that let's let's put that aside for a second. Let's let's pretend Bruce didn't say that. Let's pretend Adam said that. So, <laughs> Adam, with you saying that, yes, uh, 
I think it was ve- it was very surprising that he bought a dog and then the dog is 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 dead. But this movie was made after John Wick, right? Yeah. yeah. So you ha- they have to know going into it that oh we can't give this guy a dog because if he has a dog then it's just basically John Wick again. Listen, I, I'm at least glad that like he didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't like absolute fall in love, and then. But I, I, I'm at least gracious that they kept the the killing off screen. That was at least nice. So and, thanks for that, guys. They, did, they actually did pitch this to get distribution and funding. They pitched it as John Wick with Mads Mikkelsen. So I mean, it's like not not any question that they are aiming for that. Right, but you, you, I mean, you know what I'm saying. That, I know what you're saying, and I, I thought that was kind of a, a clever decision there. Like, who he kills his own dog? Yeah, in this movie instead of somebody else. And then, uh, when he's out burying the dog, he sees Camille, this character that will, you know, play a big part in this movie. He sees Camille outside trying to to chop wood. Now, I don't know how long she's lived in that particular house or how long <laughs> she's lived in this town. But not only did she look like she'd never chopped wood before, she looked like she'd never seen an axe before. That was pretty ridiculous, her failing. Like, did I see it wrong, or was she trying to hit the wood with, like, the flat side of the axe instead of the pointy end? <laughs> the blunt side's the tough one, isn't it? That's the, the, that means it's the heaviest. That means it's going to go down the fastest, and that'll break it up. I, I, listen, I don't know how these things work. It was like infomercial, uh, incompetent dad level from an infomercial. Her out there trying to chop that wood, though. It was pretty, uh, they sold it a little too much that she needed help chopping wood. How do I drain it, this spaghetti? I'll pour, it in the, I'll pour it in the floor. <laughs> oh, I spilled soda. Now I got to buy a new house. Yeah, like, <laughs> washing golf balls. What, you know, like, what is this? Why, why are we doing it, any of these things? Yeah, he goes over, chops the wood for her because he's burying his dog when he sees that happen. Well, that's how you got to get them off the scent of the dead dog. It's just all, it, is that birch? Oh, I certainly don't smell dead dog around here. Good job. And I also know at one point I was watching and I was like, man, this is like an old John Wick. And then I slowed down for a minute and I said, you know, I'm pretty certain Mads Mickelson is younger than Keanu Reeves. And I was very glad when I looked it up that he is indeed younger than Keanu Reeves, but he's still an old John Wick. Well, he, he's he's got one of those faces. He's got like you know Keanu Reeves for for all he's been around. It's still a a pretty pretty man, you know. Yeah, I think our go to reference that that uh, Sweet Shanzi's provided us for is like the person who was born looking fifty five is like Morgan Freeman. You know, he's got one of those born looking old faces. Mm-hmm. You go back and see Morgan Freeman in nineteen seventy four in the Electric Company. He already looks old. <laughs> that old man's haggard. It's like he's twenty six. <laughs> yeah. Same way with Mads Mikkelsen. I, and I didn't realize that I liked Mads Mikkelsen so much until I watched this. Because, I mean, other than Caecilius, I don't know that I'm familiar with him from a whole lot. But I really, really like his performance in this movie. Well, hold on a second, because not everybody's going to get their reference. That's the that's the bad guy in Doctor Strange. Yes, Caecilius <laughs> was the bad guy in Doctor Strange. But he's also in, I mean, he's in Rogue One. Yeah. He's Hannibal. I mean, he's he's done a lot of high. Hannibal's where a lot of like uh, kind of. Uh, the, uh, I think most people would probably know him because that was network television. I didn't like him as Hannibal, but uh, a lot of that's because I already knew that character Hannibal so well from Anthony Hopkins, and it's a very different version of Hannibal. But I wasn't particularly impressed with him as Hannibal, but I love him as uh, the Black Kaiser. No, it was good. Uh, I think the, really the big one that surprised me as far as acting. I mean, because I've seen Mads do you know great acting, so that's not uh, you know, ultimately a surprise. Uh, but Vanessa Hutchins was actually really good. She is good in it. I, I was I was shocked, and they kind of uglied her up a little bit, or at least yeah. planed her up, if you will, because she's a she's a beautiful young lady. From like a month or so ago, she was my choice to play Doctor Afra. So I'm glad to see the acting chops on display here. But yeah, she was she was great in like Spring Breakers, and uh, she's in a couple other flicks, mo- most of which are not super great. So it's it's good to see her kind of get a, a better role. Oh, she's in the new Bad Boys for Life as well. So there you go. She's oh. in your favorite movie, Journey to the Mysterious Island. Uh, listen, man, I've seen that, and uh, <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I know that you do not like that. Ew. Yeah. Yes, hey, you know, got her got her big break in the high school musical and went places. Her and Zach Efron both, you know, have had pretty good careers post Disney. Yeah, I listen, it's it's almost as if they breed them over there to uh, you know, to be stars. Yeah, yeah. They they know what they're doing. Uh but yeah, I, I to me this whole thing, it just seemed like 
It was overly long. I don't know why I would like Mad Mads Mickelson's character. I like the overall conceit, the idea that like once these guys get to a particular age, they they need to retire out of the system, and they retire out with a whole bunch of money. Because uh, I had an idea about the the lottery, people that would win the lottery, and like the uh, the government would, would send an assassin team out to get them, and they would have to fight the people <laughs> off in order to keep their money. Uh, this is kind of like that, but with you know. Uh, uh, assassins. A, a big glaring plot hole, though, in that driving part of the story, if we want to look at this a little more critically, um, when you hire assassins to take out retired assassins because you don't want to pay them their retirement, don't those assassins you've hired know that someday it's going to be them? It's like the looper phenomenon here. Yeah, you should. Yeah, he should have probably himself had to have taken out a couple of cats at this point, unless they, all the, again, all they have to do is drop one line that just goes, a new development in our, uh, well, in our they thoughts. And- did. They, they had that meeting where he's trying to sell the Damocles Corporation, so he wants to decrease their uh, uh, financial liability. Yeah. So they have that whole idea about they have to match his retirement. But even, you know... Even just refuse to match it. You don't have to kill the guy. <laughs> Listen, I, I drive hard bargains, not just regular yeah. bargains. But that hard was bargains. My, big, my big problem with the logic of that is don't. What are these assassins that you're hiring now? But then again, I also know how young people new to a job think they know everything better than the guy who's been doing it for thirty years, and they're convinced that they'll fe- they'll be better when it's their turn to retire. That it won't be like that. I can kind of see that too. Yeah, no, nobody can touch me. <laughs> I'm different. I'm different. <laughs> now what did you guys think about like the kind of uh, there are a lot of uh I don't know, well, maybe assassination attempts i don't know if that's the right word to use for but there's a lot of like people outside looking through scopes and you know like about that, to storm the castle fine. and all that kind of jazz did we I do like that, that too many times it felt like it was at least two or three times right oh man in a world where people play uh pub g and Fortnite and stuff you can't get too many scope shots these days. It, it, but it, in so, many, so much of it, it just felt like they didn't have their routines and everything planned out nearly as well as they should have for this, you know, elite team that is sent out to uh, get this, this you know, other elite guy. I don't know. And I think that's a little bit of the commentary about the young brash guys that think they know everything versus the old guy who, if you get old doing this, you got old because you're good at it. Okay, yeah. now let's talk about him being good at it. So when he's driving down the road and sees this chick broke down on the side of the road with her big giant hat and everything that just screams, this is no good, why does he pick her up, bring her to the thing, and then proceed to do the horizontal mambo? Like, none of these things are, like, he's an idiot. Uh, maybe maybe he's just got a, a very hungry libido. I, I mean, sure, but... If- out a way he could he figured out a way how he could do the stuff and use that to lure his assassins you know to flush them out like this way he knows okay i bring her home that's when they're going to make the move and i'm ready for it instead of worrying if it's going to happen while i'm i would love to think that was the case i this did not tell that to me via narrative i'll tell you that much and I, I also like Catherine Winnick's character, who from the beginning is telling uh, Mr. Blute there, hey, just pay this guy what you owe him and forget about it because this is going to backfire on you. I, I liked her character there, too. I like Catherine Winnick a lot, though. Is, or, or is your favorite role of hers from Fifty First Dates? No, it's from Vikings, but yeah, I figured it's pretty it's much all I know her from. I figured it as much. Yeah. She was in the Dark Tower, too. Boy, I tried to forget as much as that as I possibly could. Yeah, I don't say yeah. Don't it's a lousy movie. What a what a stinker. <laughs> the best the best description I've seen of the Dark Tower was Matthew McConaughey and Idris Elba like deciding together. Let's let's phone this one in. <laughs> like let's have a contest to see who can be less enthusiastic about the project. Um, but yeah, back to this movie. I I here's what I think. I do agree with you that it was a little too long, and I really like the first hour. But I think this movie could have ended at about an hour and 15 because at the first hour, I thought it was almost over and I checked and there was a whole nother hour left. But it really lost me for a little bit when we get to the extended torture sequence, four days of torture. I've never been one that really enjoys a movie that decide like that was my biggest complaint about the Punisher was the prolonged torture scene. Um, and this has that same problem with me, which is like. Uh, do you, you know, I see the gruesome torture on the first day. I don't really need to see it for three days. Yeah, it's over the top. It's it's egregious, but like it's almost it's almost even worse because 
it's shot so poorly. It like yeah, this whole I, torture I scene I, is shot just so generic and bland and maybe this is what he was going for of like oh I'm just going to show the the staleness of this and how he's just but it doesn't the rest of the movie none of that's congruent with anything else that's on the screen so th- that the reading doesn't make a lot of sense it just felt like really boring lazy directing where it was just like hey we threw some w- wicked graphics and stuff on the screen and then just kind of had him laugh you know maniacally as he you know punches holes in the guy's body that's boring and, and that's you know like I said that that's what lost me. First off, I'd like to see this guy being good enough that he never gets caught and tortured. I mean, of course, he maybe suffers along the way. He needs to have some great suffering and overcome some serious odds. But uh, once you've got him in chains, you know, you think anybody who understands how deadly this guy is, like the first thing you do is you like, I don't know, you you cut his hands off or you, you know what I mean? At you least like break something. all the fingers or something so he can't get a hold yeah. of guns or weapons or anything of that nature. My goodness. You blind, him right off, you blind him right off the bat so that, you know, just in case he does get some up to something and try to escape, he's harmless. Like, I would think you just would disable him on the, the first chance you got, even if you didn't want to kill him quickly, you'd still like, you know, disable him right away. Uh, Matt, Matt Lucas's character, uh, let's, let's talk about it. It's, it's just terrible. Who's it's, Matt Lucas? It's the bald guy. He's, he's Blute? the, uh, he's the fat Blute. guy yeah. from Little Britain. Okay. Is that Mr. Blute, the Blute. one that wears yeah. the wig? Mm-hmm. The, like, uh, stork bite on his face? Correct. Okay. What about it, man? I, I thought he was fine. Fun. It's just, it's so bad. I mean, it's, it's cliche. It's terrible. It's not, like I said, if, again, if you're... If you're 14 years old, this is fine. But I think anybody with a high school education just goes, "This is terrible." It's 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 so boring and generic. I wish it was something that was that had some flavor to it. And I'll be honest with you guys, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, I kind of wish I would have watched the trailer for this. Maybe I'll, I'll admit that there, that may have not knowing what any of this is going in before watching it, aside for the name and the star of the film. Maybe I would have had a different reaction to this, but poof, no, not good for me. The name was a little confusing to me, too, but uh, more to say about Matt Lucas before I derail us. No, no, no. But, you know, I just picture like, yeah, he probably inherited the Damocles, Corpor- the Damocles Corporation from his father when his father died like 18 months ago. And that's why this guy's an idiot. Yeah, I figured he's not who built this this company from the ground up. But once again, that requires me to make up my own backstory to make it. Yeah, palatable. which which we shouldn't have to do. <laughs> but the the name also confused me. Like with the name Polar, I really expected something to end up going down, like in the Arctic Circle or in Antarctic. You know what I mean? Like. I don't understand why Polar. Yeah, I was, I, that was going to be one of my main questions at the, for you guys at the end of this is uh, why the name Polar? I, I do not follow. You have any insight, Sean? I don't. I don't. I don't know why they call it that. Jeez, Louise! What a what a great what a great sign for a movie that you finished the whole darn thing in three people, three four separate viewings. If we're counting Sean's two, which I believe that we do. And we still don't know why it's named the thing that it's named. I mean, I guess you could say that about anything, but. Uh, John Wick. I know why it's named John Wick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you got why? a clue. Same reason Superman's called Superman and Super Lopez is called Super Lopez. My Hero Movie Sup- Podcast is called Hero Movie Podcast. It's what we do. Read it in the name. I don't know if you know anything about me, but I like to have shows where people know exactly what we are right away. Yeah, they should have called it Duncan and his retirement and how they tried to screw him out of his retirement so he had to get even. That would have been a great title. Fiona Apple, the soundtrack. <laughs> I might have watched that movie. I might have watched that one. But yeah, it lost me for a little bit with that extended torture scene. But then I'm enjoying his, uh, you know, given Mr. Blute his comeuppance at the end. But I, I, I do want to go back to the very beginning, though. When I saw Johnny Knoxville, first off, I, I didn't think it was really Johnny Knoxville. I thought this must just be a guy. That, then it became terribly obvious. Nope. <laughs> this is Johnny Knoxville. And I was like, how did I not know? Like me knowing Johnny Knoxville was in the movie. I don't know if that would have hurt me or helped me going into it. <laughs> but it's certainly jarring when the first thing you see on screen in what you think is a Mads Mikkelsen movie is Johnny Knoxville. Like I imagine that Venn diagram has only crossed over once. 
Well, I, I am at least glad that he only had as much screen time as he did because I was I was fearing a like, oh no, is Johnny Knoxville in this thing for a long period of time because we are in for something. Oh, I'm worried he was going to be like the one that gets away in the beginning and they send Mads Mickelson after him. Like I thought this was going to be a cat and mouse game oh, no. with Mr. Knoxville and Mads Mickelson. Oh, so bad. Uh, but then again, I, it, it doesn't feel like they gave him much of a script. They were just like, uh, you just do what you want there, uh, Johnny. Have fun. <laughs> Plus, like the whole time I'm seeing him in the uh, uh, sexy time with Cindy there, I'm, all I can think about was like, you know, in real life, he has to use a catheter to go to the bathroom and stuff. The guy's messed up his junk from too much jackass. Uh, let that be a lesson to you, kids. Be very, <laughs> very upper careful. Upper body themed stunts. <laughs> you know, a bad shoulder. A bad rotator cuff is one thing, but when you have to straight cath yourself to go to the bathroom, yeah, it's a little, it's a little too much. Uh, what else can we talk about with this thing? Because I like to me, all to, and again, that's why, that's why I was just like, I, I don't know what we're going to talk about with this movie because nothing really happens for two full hours. He kills some people. That again, that hallway scene is fantastic. I love the violence level. I love the gunplay stuff. Uh, you know, hiding behind people and kind of using them as human shields and just the, the massive amount of destruction that was in that. It's just like, there there are like fun scenes and stuff like that that are highlighted throughout, but like the connective tissue for me just didn't do it. Yeah, and this, this uh, I don't know what you want to call it, the, the rookie team, the new team, like his go-to team since the older Mads Mickelson is retiring, this squad of four, don't really seem all that impressive to me. Or if anything, there's like maybe two of them that seem to be make sense. But then there's a couple there that are just like dead weight. Like you could um, contract out that part of the job once you get to the site. They don't have to travel with you. Like I don't <laughs> think you necessarily need to take Cindy with you from location to location. And then they add Junkie Jane at the end who seems like an interesting character. But it's like she's poochy. Like all of a sudden she's part of the team. Like, there's no Junkie Jane for the first few bits of their caper. Then suddenly Junkie Jane shows up and she's part of the team, but she's also the one who's a junkie. Yeah, I, I that's that's a ridiculous bit. Uh, I also, when they're going in and they're, like, just the, like the torturing of the fat guy scene and everything, it's just like, what what are we doing here, man? I don't know, like, I just, like, this movie just felt gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were some gross moments. There's, but like, but there was that. That was gross. Like all the sex stuff. None of it is sexy. It's all gross sex kind of stuff. It's just like I don't know. I just, I just felt dirty watching it. I will tell you, the chowder buckets seemed extremely gratuitous because I was, I'm, like Sean says, a movie that the the key demographic that's going to enjoy this movie, you don't need to be throwing that much of the chowder buckets at them. No, and that was the thing of like if you look back at a lot of those eighties movies that, you know, many people think that there's tons of nudity and stuff in, there's like, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. But, you know, in I mean, Corman himself said it. it's just like, hey, there's a couple of few spots that you gotta do and the kids think that they've seen a lot more than they actually have. Yeah, but also those eighties movies would have a point where like the lady's shirt would just fly off for no reason that made any sense just to squeeze in the, the chowder buckets well i mean strong winds are strong winds bruce uh, i don't know what you know about meteorological events but uh these things happen i'll step on the escalator oops where did my dress go oh no it was all it's all very uh <laughs> all what was his name benny hill the yeah. wind resistance here is terrible <laughs> you know the button industry really has gone downhill the last couple of decades we've been talking about it you know real quietly but i think it's time we start letting people know that uh, buttons a, a just aren't doing it these days a great counterpoint to this is i can watch john wick with the kids you know that like the action stuff my older kids but i would couldn't watch this i i don't even want to watch this with anybody no you know, this of, is and, and sean talks about this a lot of like if people came into the to the room when you're watching this movie i'm embarrassed anybody watches me watch this movie it's it's that it's of that level most of this movie wouldn't bother me but the chowder bucket scenes like when my if my wife walked in when i'm watching certain scenes in this movie she would not believe i was watching it for the podcast he's over there she's over there just going hey honey look at mad's ass look at it look ooh, look at that <laughs> and <There>. suggested it <laughs> yeah so uh there is a character in this movie that i i think that if you were going to make another movie uh based on on this property here um you could do it and you could even make it interesting. And I think that that character is the, 
the lady that he goes and sees to recover. You know, after he gets tortured, he goes. Jasmine. 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 Because Jasmine has all the cool toys. And so Jazz, the story would be Jasmine. The next one, it wouldn't be Black Kaiser. It wouldn't be uh, uh, Camille. It's none of those characters. It's 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 her. Yeah. You know, I think Jasmine is the, is the cool character that you've literally seen three minutes of. The problem is, is that no one would know that this <laughs> is a sequel to this movie. <laughs> I, but, I think hey, we cool. could just call it Polar too. I mean, Polar doesn't mean anything clearly. Polar Jasmine. Um, I I didn't even think about that. What you suggest there, Sean, I hadn't thought about that, but that sounds pretty good. I know the direction that the comics go with the sequels kind of hinted at at the end of this, but uh, you know, when when I guess we talk about the twist that Camille was this little girl who he felt bad because he killed her parents. Right. And he's been sending her 200 grand a year every year. And she knows who he is and he gives her the chance to kill him and she doesn't do it. But then like the sequel comic is Camille and uh, Black Kaiser are now a team and they're out to get revenge against the people who hired Mads Mikkelsen to kill her parents. That's how he pays her back, like the blood debt. Listen, that that idea sounds at least a little bit more entertaining than what we've got here, I think. I mean, I, again, I, I like the overall story of it and where things kind of go. I just feel like the execution is quite poor. The, you know what this really feels like, this movie? It feels like one of those movies that came out after Pulp Fiction came out in the 90s. Mm-hmm. That's really what this feels like. Like, oh, that's what people want. So we'll make that. And they kind of don't get it. <laughs> and so they make they make their version of what they think that is. And I also think they could have streamlined this story for the purposes of a movie. Now, a web comic that comes out, you know, whenever it comes out, do what you want there. But a movie's just a totally different medium. And I think streamlining the story, like uh, part of what I love so much about that first John Wick is there's hints of this whole underground society that he's from. But it's basically just a guy going through town trying to get somebody and kill him, you know, and this could have been pretty good if he's retiring that he finds out they're trying to kill him. So the whole movie is just him dodging the assassins they send after him till he kills them all and gets back and kills the main guy. I mean, if you're if you're pitching it as John Wick with Mads Mikkelsen then give us John Wick with Mads Mikkelsen. Maybe you don't need to include the complicated uh, twist with Camille there. You know, I, I feel like they're trying to make this uh, a different movie there than what they're giving us through the bulk of it. Well, it, it's like when you when you talk about like the comparison between John Wick and everything, the big thing is, is that John Wick goes through, it's got its little tiny story, and honestly, the majority of that movie is just fantastic action. Here they're trying to weave in a story and the story just isn't really there. It doesn't really it doesn't really do much. When they get to the action stuff, that stuff works, but it feels like they're trying to be almost too heady in a movie that doesn't kind of deserve that. Or at least the I, I one half of it. I think you're saying the same doesn't. thing I'm saying, Adam. Yeah, yeah, I don't I think they tried to make it too uh add a little too much depth with the Camille storyline. Well, you guys will be very glad to hear this, but the guy who wrote the screenplay for this, Jason Rothwell, he also, uh, on deck, has written screenplay for the new League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Oh, so, goody. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be watching it whether I want to or not. Yeah, that's going to be <laughs> exciting. But it just... I. It, it feels like a lesser version, but like when you're watching John Wick and you have all that stuff that's in the background with the whole, you know, the Assassin's Guild and all that kind of garbage and stuff, that's nice little, you know, uh, garnish to the meal that is John Wick. Uh, but that's not the thing. You, you ultimately don't super care about all that stuff. What you're doing is using that as a platform to the next great, amazing action scene. And, and this, and this is just I, like, ah, we've got a couple of action scenes that will splice into this fairly boring story. And that's also why I like the uh, first John Wick better than the sequels, too, is the sequels start diving too, uh, I won't say too much, they just dive more into that mythos, where the first one, I liked it because it was just a very straightforward story. Yeah, especially with the third one, because they, they, they come up across their own rules and stuff, and they 
they don't even they barely even know what they're talking about anymore it seems my problem with john wick is that so there's assassins who are homeless <laughs> like if they're if they're so if they're if they're assassins wouldn't they have money they're like just amazingly they poor assassins not very good at their job they're just not good at it nah, i guess yeah. i think that's their cover that's how they blend in and become invisible like they got tons of money but they spend it all on pigeons i also for, like that idea you know, as well i i like the idea of i'm i'm the richest assassin in the world but i'm also doubling as a homeless man because that makes it easier for me to kill folk i can't wait till i'm done with this so i can get in my rocket car <laughs> and of course one big difference between John Wick in this movie is not only the director, but then uh, Miller. I don't know, was he an assistant director or whatever? They had two super talented action directors on that movie, and this had one guy who is neither of those two. Yeah, I mean, they were it's two stunt men that were directing John Wick uh, with the first one and everything, and they knew what they were doing. And this is obviously not a guy who's uh, he did a, you know, a small Swedish film and, and some music videos, and that's been about it. And, did the Lords of Chaos. Yeah, Lords of Chaos. I mean, like I said, that's that's his biggest profile thing. And and people that saw it really enjoyed it. I know a lot of uh, of, of my friends that are into kind of genre stuff have seen it and uh, enjoyed it. But uh, not yet for me. Not yet. Uh, but before we get to our final review here and everything, we do have to ask ourselves one very important question. And it is how in the world this movie relates back one-to-one with the most magnanimous man in Hollywood, Sylvester Stallone. Why, thank you, Adam. I have a prepared statement. Hmm. Brittany Amos is the visual effects coordinator on Polar, which is a big deal because she's only been in the business for three years. Wow. So what, some of you may ask? She's the boss on a direct-to-Netflix movie that doesn't have many visual effects. Who cares? Well, let me tell you who cares. I do. Brittany Amos has done something that not too many people do this early in their career. She gets to wear the boss pants. And she says to the other people in her department things like, I need you to visual effects things better. And they respond, <laughs> right away, boss. Maybe she says something like, I've been around a few visually affecting people in my time, but you folks are the most visually effective people I have ever been around. Because Brittany Amos is a motivator and a team captain, and she remembers her co-workers' birthdays. She's even nice to Jean, even though other people in the visual effects department think Jean is slow and an anchor around the entire department's neck. Brittany thinks there's something about him that the other people in the department can't see, so she's nice to him and takes him under her wing, which Jean misinterprets as romantic love. <laughs> And on a random Wednesday night, the crew decides to go to a karaoke bar and take the edge off of their highly demanding jobs. Gene's never been too great around women, but with Brittany, he's more at ease than with other women. And so after Brittany Amos takes the roof off the karaoke bar with, with her barn-burning version of Gwen Stefani's Let Me Blow Your Mind, Gene decides to make his move. And because Gene is an emotionally stunted American nerd, he decides the best way to tell her how he feels is by quoting a line from his favorite movie, Team America World Police. And it starts with the line, see, there's three types of people in this world. But I, but I can't say the rest because it's a family podcast with family values and family and the Bible. Anyway, it didn't go well. And now Gene is an outspoken pro-Trunk nut job on Twitter. Brittany Amos also worked on Creed 2 in the visual effects department. And Creed 2 starred and was written by a man who's never listened to a podcast, or as people his age like to call it, fake radio, Sylvester Stallone. No word on Gene, but rumors are he's starting a show with a failed comedian and a former entertainment journalist to start a, quote, funny, unquote, conservative talking head show called News Clues. And there you have it, HM Piers. This week's Stallone connection is Brittany Amos. Uh, she's a woman who has the world on a string, sitting <laughs> on a rainbow. I'm Sean Kovacs. You are welcome. Oh, have you seen some of these videos that Stallone is putting out? Oh my gosh, he's having these football parties. He's got like Jay Glazer and Al Pacino, Guy Fieri's in his kitchen cooking. It's just like it is. 
He's got like 8 billion people. Like every one of these people you know is over at his house, and he's just entertaining and all kinds of crap. It's hilarious. It's fantastic. Stallone, you are. You, you, he just, all right, he needs to know about this show. Just tweet Sylvester Stallone until he, you know, knows about the show. For heaven's sake, please. It just. He's never going to know about the show. No. Man. He's not even on his own. T- listen, maybe, listen I, I, I'll tell you this much. We can shoot for Frank Stallone. Yeah, yeah, that's. More I think reason. I think we can get Frank Stallone if we really try. So, I mean, you don't settle for Frank Stallone. Guys. <laughs> you did, don't settle. He for does Frank. enough of a sly impression that I, I think we, it might could pass well enough. <laughs> Just straight and barfly. Uh, so let's get down to it here at Hero Movie Podcast. We have our own Robin rating system. If you'd like to check that out, head on down to facebook.com slash Hero Movie Podcast. It's right there at the top of the screen. And while you're there, throw a like on a page, why don't you? Bruce, where does Polar on Netflix fall on the Robin rating system for you? Uh, like I said before, it, it's like John Wick with Mads Mikkelsen with a dash of Leon, the professional, thrown in. Uh even though it's more an implied Lyon, we don't get the direct stuff there. Um, but I liked it good enough. It didn't bore me. And, I, you know, following up last week's coverage of The Saint, I'm just happy to see something that didn't bore me. And I usually give a, a Damian Wayne, like in two situations, either I didn't like the movie, but I can see where other people would, or I did like the movie, but I can see where other people wouldn't, you know, so like a split decision. This is one of those where I like the movie good enough. Uh, but I could totally understand why maybe other people like you wouldn't, Adam. So I'm going to give it the middle of the road, Damian Wayne. Cool. Sean, what do you think? Oh, I'm in the exact same spot. I'm Damian Wayne. It's a low end. Expect nothing. If you're, if you're like, hey, I just want to watch a movie that's dumb and people kill people and sometimes it's clever and sometimes they're pretty, uh, this is the movie for you. Uh, the other part to this movie that we never even touched on is that uh, the director should throw a couple of shekels Guy Ritchie's way. A um, lot of lot of Guy Ritchie-ness to this movie without it being Guy Ritchie. Yeah, a little bit of that. Uh, this is uh, this is Jason Todd for me. I hated this thing. I, I wish I liked it. There's enough... There's enough cool action scenes that I would go back and watch those scenes specifically again, but nothing more. The story is just terrible. Like I said, I, I've, I've ranted enough about how I dislike this movie, uh, but I have I have no taste for it. No, no polar two, please. No, thank you. I don't want. To, I'm good. No thanks. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to watch next week. Hopefully, we'll have some uh, better options on the table and everything. But before we talk about what that is, Bruce, where might we find more of your work on the internet? Uh, first off, just want to say happy birthday to Dave Bautista, Drax, the best one of the best turd joke makers in the business. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can. Uh, Check me out on Chubby Wizard. We're going to give our uh, Chubbies here soon, the annual uh, comic book awards that we let the fans vote on. What's that trophy look like? It, it It's, you know, just whatever I got left over from uh, those participation trophies when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. It's macrame. Yeah, Chubby Wizard. Let's check out Chubby Wizard. Uh, Sean, you have you have the most amazing Twitter uh, I've heard. This is what I've heard. That's the rumors going around. Is that true? Uh, sweet Seanzy from the internet, exclamation point, at Sean Kovacs 4. <laughs> However, I would like to concede my time to bring up something that we never talked about on the show, which is that, Bruce, what say you about No Watchmen Season 2? Oh, yeah. Uh- you know, it's not, it's kind of expected, right? Isn't that yeah. sort of what we were set up for? So, yeah, I wanted a season two and they're not going to give it to me, but I didn't want a season one and they did. So it all works out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it, it, everything works out for the for the best sometimes. Uh, so yeah, check that check that out if you haven't and you've uh, watched Watchmen and you haven't listened to uh, the Redford administration. Go check that out. Or if you uh, like the Mandalorian on the Disney Plus, check out Mandalorian Thirty Questions available wherever you find finer podcasts. Uh, so next week we are uh, you know you can be like our good friend. What was his nick- new nickname again? I, I totally forgot. 
Cincinnati Slingshot. New Slingshot which, uh, was in there. <laughs> uh, Cincinnati Slingshot. You can be just like him and everybody else and get to vote on what we watch every single month over at patreon.com slash HMP. And that's for any level. Even if you're at the dollar level, you get to help shape this show and uh, put it in whatever direction that you want. Here are the nominees up for the Patreon vote this month. So next week we will either cover uh, Alien versus Predator, Two Guns, Return of Swamp Thing, or 1010. Quite the uh, varied selection there for you. Uh, so that will go up probably on Tuesday for your vote. And uh, vote quickly and we'll uh, cover whatever you guys tell us to cover because you help this show happen. Patreon.com slash HMP. That is it, everybody. Join us next week for your Patreon selections. For Bruce Leslie and Sweet Shonzi from the Internet, my name's Adam Portress. Stay super, everybody. Bye, Marty and Evie.